session is Dr. Kamlesh. And she is an assistant professor in SR, SRKP Government PG College, Krishnanagar. And sorry, associate pro professor. Associate professor. And our co-chair is Dr. Saroj Gupta. Okay. I am okay. here, therefore. Okay. <laughs> Sir? So, our resource person is Dr. Renuka Sh uh, Sham. Is she present over here? So our resource person is Renuka Sham Narayan. She is a research assistant, Interdisciplinary Institute of Human Security and Governance, New Delhi. Ma'am, please come on the stage. So our another resource person is Dr. Rajini Chaudhary, Associate Professor from Sabarmati University, Ahmedabad. Okay, so ma'am, Due to the shortage of time, I would like to skip many of the things. Okay, now everybody was speaking about the global concern, the wars and all these things, COVID and all these things. But I thought that I should concentrate on my country and especially within the capital of the country that what is the perception and attitude towards skill development, which our Honorable Prime Minister inaugurated very largely, and what is the ground level Im implications and what was its impact. So I started on that and I took 300 parents to go through it. And this is the concept of what is the perception attitude and it is broadly, I think you all know it about it. So there is no need of repetition. And what we find that even in the, even among the academicians and lawyers and whatever you say professionals, there is a very shortage of skills. So we are not concentrated on the soft skill, but basically we are going for the hard skills. And due to the lack of soft skills, we are not getting the enough jobs also. And in the job market, we are lacking it. And our students are also very much sufferer of this part. Next, this is the literary view, I'm not going to that. And my objective was to analyze the working people's skill through training and development. And whether we are receiving enough educate training or development, even those who are working in any government offices or academics or universities, they are not at all getting this training and development at regular interval. So we are lacking something because we are not getting new, which and the trainers are not available for this purpose also. If I am wrong, kindly point it out. And I formulated seven hypotheses regarding their mentality and their perception and attitude towards this thing. Because a lot of people know it, but their perception is somewhat 
crowded and their attitude towards is very slack okay they don't go want to go for it who will waste the time what will they achieve and this is the impact which comes on their children and our students are also lacking and moving in a diff several dimensions and the design was oh, i lost my sorry i forgot my spec and i am unable to see it so um, main point sir okay sir, okay now this was the test i conducted on that yeah, yeah, yeah. and the result is i think almost all are rejected and one is one or two is not rejected okay now the conclusion again is not seen but the main main things are that students from the rural uh, part those who are migrated in delhi they are too much keen to get this job and students from hindi background uh, they are the most sufferer because they are unable to catch up with the english medium students and this is the main thing i think now suggestions i have quoted only four suggestions that Uh, we should go for uh, change in curriculums the so called traditional method of teaching should be changed and this type of study should be conducted all across the country so that we should know what is going on in the main battlefield and unless and until we solve our unemployment and skilled manpower problem we cannot become a what you say develop country thank you thank you sir you have said the success of any organization depends upon skilled expert workforce so this is the viable in this development arena of india thanks sir uh, for your analytical study so now i would like to next dr sangeeta angam topic is ethnic conflicts of manipur 2023 exploring the origins impediments and pathways dr sangeeta angam is here so now we move to the next speaker dr uday van singh role of media in attaining the good governance dr uday van singh associate professor Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Atri Banerjee. Uh, very warm welcome to all the dignitaries on and off the dais, and thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to present this paper, which is basically a research paper in these two areas by myself and the principal of my college. What we try to show is the SDG Goal Nine, which talks about inclusive growth, resilient infrastructure through Triple P, which is public-private partnership. And we will later on show that how this could be a model perfect for these two areas, so that the communities can be lifted towards financial security and towards inclusive growth also. So this is the Indian situation right now. If you talk about the Human Development Index. There is livelihood challenges in these two areas, like Purulia and Sundarbans. Uh, as all of us know, that Sundarbans is a mangrove vegetation area, extremely vulnerable towards um, flood, and Purulia is an area which is extremely vulnerable towards drought. These two extreme geographical locations, although they share extremity in terms of geography, there are certain similarities which I'll show later. uh this is basically triple p which goes with sdg 9 that is to build resilient infrastructure promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation this is a literature review which gave us the impetus to work on this uh we can see that even the niti aayog is advertising for this triple p and there are certain uh, triple p projects in northern part of india in himachal pradesh uttar pradesh and in southern part including karnataka the objective of the paper was basically to look into the socio economic vulnerability and the cultural discourses and then to analyze how triple p can solve the problems of financial insecurity and hunger so the methodology basically used for collection of primary data was pretested schedule in depth interviews and fgd in sundarbans because i cannot grab hold of enough number of people in purulia because they are mostly santals and they are not 
that much interested to come in front of the video or anything. So that is only done in Sundarbans and observation. And the secondary data were basically taken from library work and scholarly articles. So this is a study site. This is Sundarban. Uh, you can see only uh, the Sagar block. Most of <coughs> the islands have been submerged post Isla and then Amphan and Yas. And this is Purulia, where we have taken these villages. Uh, only Rahamda, there is one village which is multi-ethnic, and others are uh, Santal villages around a forest named Rakhab. This is a land distribution. So what we have seen is that we have given pre Isla. You can see there is uh, the amount of no land has increased immensely, almost near to double or so. And the amount of nil land holding in Purulia is also very high. So this proves that the agricultural field is not very fertile. Either it has gone saline or it is infertile with red soil. And the Santals or the local community can only sustain with forest resources. This is a distribution of agricultural holding, and this is the type of livelihood that they practice post Isla. That is, who were farmers, they have shifted to opportunistic livelihood that includes like fishing or anything, collection of animal or anything. And mostly it has been seen that they have opted for migrant laborers. We have seen during COVID times that we don't have any such data on migrant workers, but most of the housewives they move to other districts as migrant laborers. The same case is happening in Purulia. Uh, I have marked in red, those are the migrant laborers. And you can see there are certain practices like lac and tasar. I don't, I think you know about tasar, that is wild silk, not the artificial one. It has huge market in, in like international market. So that is also on the decline. Um, so these are the findings. Uh, you, as you can see, in both the places, the findings are almost same with huge migrant laborers. They cannot sustain their livelihood through their indigenous ways. And women are also prone to this migration. And what Triple P can solve is that as these lack um, products and the wild tusser, they have huge international demand. Through Triple P, we can bring into the ambit the local population, the government that will be there, and the um, private companies can invest money and then they can sell this products at a sustainable rate where there, there will be a financial uplift. And to conclude, uh, PPP basically brings forward a legal framework. We have a legal, legal framework now and it takes into account the situation of the disadvantaged section which is also mentioned in the Vienna conference of 1993. Uh, this is basically this research has been done with UGC funding. Uh, these are some pictures where you can see there is embankment failure. These are taken by us, both the researchers, in uh, Sundarban. You can see another one. This is Ghuramara Island, which is almost is submerged. Yes, I have concluded. Yes. Only these are the pictures, and thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, <laughs> at the outset, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, <clears throat> at the time, is three, four minutes? Three. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll drop that. Okay. So, my the focus of my uh, presentation is basically on India's ties uh, with the Gulf region. Uh, I'll begin by giving a brief overview of, you know, the uh, background, however much I can give, and then I look at how the relations between. India and the Gulf countries are no longer restricted just to bilateral issues, but how India and Gulf countries have started working within uh, what is called plurilateral arrangements and obviously on the multilateral platforms as well. So uh, traditionally, if you look at it, uh, India's ties with the Gulf have always been looked at from the lens of a very large Indian diaspora over there. Uh, obviously, the uh, you know United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, they all have a large population. Even the other uh, three uh, Gulf nations, they have a large population. And apart from that, uh, oil imports. So generally, we have looked at the India-Gulf relationship, especially India-UAE, India-Saudi Arabia, from the lens of oil and diaspora. Now. In the past few years, a few significant changes have taken place. The first is obviously the, uh, the 
focus of Gulf countries on reducing their dependence upon oil. So you have every Gulf countries coming, you know, that at least, I mean, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, their visions, like Vision 2030 and so on, so they get more uh, attention. But even other Gulf countries have been focusing on reducing their dependence upon oil. Now, that has also brought about a change in their foreign policy orientation. So their economic priorities, then the changing geopolitical landscape within the Middle East itself. You see earlier, you, you, need, you looked at it from binaries. It's very tough today to look at the Middle East in terms of any simplistic binaries. The Israel-Palestine conflict for the, has changed that. But if you look at the Abraham Accords, they were beginning to, you know, the landscape of the Middle East had changed. And then, of course, India, uh, the economic goals, economic policies of India with a focus on infrastructure, with a focus of diversifying its oil uh, basket, oil import basket, uh, you know, the uh, changing geopolitics within South Asia, other important geopolitical developments, they have also pushed India, uh, strengthened the India-GCC relationship, which is robust even earlier, but it has got a fill-in. Now, the most important uh, development, I think, in terms of which has really helped uh, the India-Gulf relationship, largely India-Saudi and India-UA relationship of going beyond just the bilaterals, is the geo important geopolitical developments like Russia-Ukraine, uh, and now even what has happened in the Middle East, because basically, like a lot of other middle parts, you know, India and the other middle parts, even within the Gulf, they're trying to balance out. So they have good relations with the US, they have good relations with, the, they want to keep a working relationship with Russia. So that, uh, the knack of middle powers of seeking a balance is one of the, uh, is an important uh, sort of common ground. Now, as a result of that, you have, I mean, a perfect illustration of that is two parallel groupings which you have. I mean, you have, the India, France, UAE trilateral on the one hand, which was basically a message to the US that, I mean, the India, France, UAE trilateral, they're working on energy issues, there is maritime cooperation. On the other hand, you have a quad also, a West Asia quad. So India, UAE, Israel, and US. And that's where there's talk of this India Middle East corridor and so on and so forth. Now, specifically in the, uh, in the context of uh, running out of time. So in the context of multilaterals, if you look at some of the important developments, UAE and uh, Oman were invited as special guests to the G20. Uh, the India Middle East corridor was discussed in the G20. Uh, apart from that, India and UAE have also been uh, cooperating clo the, uh, closely. The COP28 is going to be held later this month in UAE. And on that also, they've been trying to find common ground whereby uh, there is a transition to clean energy, but at the same time it is done in such a way that it is economically sustainable and countries of the global south can make that transition. So these are some of the uh, uh, developments. Now what is what are the key opportunities and challenges for India and the Gulf to work beyond just uh, the bilateral relations? I think obviously the first opportunity is economic. So India has already, India signed an FTA with UAE that has helped in boosting the bilateral trade. India is in talks even with the GCC as a whole with regard to an FTA, um, that is there. And I think trade, bilateral trade is estimated at well over 2022-23 was estimated at about 240 billion. So economic relations are there. The, the uh, strategic cooperation, uh, between uh, not just UAE any longer, but UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and other countries with India. Now, beyond that, I think the uh, what is also an opportunity will, is, is also a challenge that, you see, while on the one hand, as I said, like, uh, you know, India and the middle parts within the Gulf, they are seeking to balance. So they can be a common, on Russia, Ukraine, for instance, you can see there, was, there were some similarities in the policy. But there will be divergences also in foreign policy because the Gulf, for instance, has got much closer to China also. In the last few years, 
what is happening is that the US has withdrawn and as a result of that, the GCC countries have very robust ties with China. So China's role in the Middle East is important now. There won't be any direct divergences, but there won't be absolute convergence. So that is a constraint. And also in the present situation in the Middle East, in the conflagration between Israel and Palestine, over there also the stand of the Gulf countries, so far, Gulf countries also are not totally on the same page because UAE, for instance, has been a bit, the UAE stance, because it's already signed the Abraham Accords, is a bit different. But the stance of Gulf countries would be, could, there could be differences between India and the uh, Gulf. But the broad uh, scope, the broad canvas, if you look at it, if you look at issues like climate change, if you look at infrastructure, uh, if you look at uh, many other, like, so for instance, food security, if you look at the, uh, you know, the uh, changing, change in the, uh, uh, this supply chains, especially with regard to semiconductors and technology, there are very broad convergences over there. But in, in terms of foreign policy linkages, they, they may not be those very similar convergences. Similarly, the approach, the traditional approach of India towards multilateral bodies is very different. The approach is very different from that of Gulf countries. Gulf countries have become proactive in foreign policy. They have started focusing a lot on foreign policy in the past few years. Whereas India has had a proactive foreign policy which was not just transactional. You see, Gulf countries have been following a very, tr the focus has been more on economic issues always. It's true. That is not there in the case of India. So these minor divergences will be there. But on the whole, uh, I think the uh, convergences are more and especially with Gulf countries also becoming more and more. So for instance, whether we look at uh, BRICS, uh, I've mentioned already G20 that UAE and Oman were invited, but uh, uh, you know, uh, the entry of Saudi Arabia and UAE into BRICS, then also in the SEO also, you have uh, GCC countries as uh, dialogue partners and as observers. So they are, with their proactivity, that gives scope and the fact that they also want to sort of balance they don't they one of the biggest I, mean, I keep on coming to that again they have categorically said that they don't really want to make choices especially uae has said we don't want to make any choices but in the context of us and china us and russia and so on. so that will now how does that apart from the environmental issues the economic issues the transactional issues how will will that in the future play a greater role in these countries working together on multilateral uh, platforms. There is a lot of scope for that. So I think while I just like to conclude by saying that we often look at uh, the GCC, we, even within India, often we focus a lot on the great powers. It's important to look at the growing role of middle powers and some of the Gulf countries, their role is going to increase even more. And just at a very simple, I mean, for instance, even in things like, you know, often we look, we view the diaspora in the Gulf from a particular lens, view the diaspora in the West from a particular lens. Even the, the both UAE and Saudi Arabia also focusing a lot on drawing uh, 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 talent from different parts of the world. And there is immense potential for India to cooperate over there as well. That's not part of you know the uh, a global issue, but in terms of fulfilling their labor deficiencies and all and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hello and Namaskar. I am Chinmay Bendre. I come from MIT World Peace University, Pune, and I am currently associated as a senior research associate with the university. Uh, today I stand before your August audience, and I would like to deliver some insights on India's evolving landscape, navigating security, identity, and global governance within the SDGs framework. Now, the first aspect is uh, I'll briefly uh, I'll briefly take you through. Uh, the sustainable development goals. We are not going to get into the specifics of it because of paucity of time. Uh, however, I would like to delve a little deeper into how India has played a role in the global governance and the framing of these goals. Uh, taking from that point onwards, we'll also look into how energy has become India's security and identity conundrum. And then we'll finally end by looking at India's energy scenario. 
Now, as we all already know, sustainable development goals are a successor goals to the Millennium Development Goals, which were brought in in 2015 as a part of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. These goals have been uh, adopted by the United Nations. And these 17 goals are further divided into 169 targets. Uh, these targets are to be achieved, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we need to have uh, a quality life for all the citizens of the world. However, what differentiates SDGs from MDGs is the fact that SDGs allow for what is known as voluntary nationally determined contributions. I'll come back to this point when I discuss India's security conundrums. Now, taking this point onwards, uh, what has been India's role in terms of global governance in framing the SDGs? So there are five uh, very prominent addressable areas. And I think the first addressable area is the fact that India was a part of the 30-member uh, framing team, which came to be known as the Open Working Group. And uh, it has negotiated over a period of uh, one and a half years through 13 different uh, rounds of negotiations. Now, this table on the slideshow, as you can see, most of you would be uh, able to identify that the language of uh, the negotiations that Indian diplomats have been able to portray during the rounds of negotiations are very much the same as we find them in the SDGs. For instance, addressing unsustainable consumption and production of the developed world is become SDG 12. Uh, when we look at uh, total eradication of poverty, that has become SDG 1. Uh, if you look at the utilization of ICTs and prevention of communicable diseases, uh, the same language has been used for SDG 3, and so on and so forth for SDG 4, as well as for SDG 17. Uh, now, the next aspect of India's contribution to global governance in SDGs comes in the form of what is known as nationally determined contributions. Uh, at the outset of Paris Climate Change uh, Summit in 2015, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has voluntarily declared that India would contribute to climate change action positively. And uh, there are three specific areas that we would be looking at. The first actionable area is we would be reducing our carbon intensity by some 33 to 35% by the end of 2030. The other area is uh, we will be deriving at least 40% of our installed total energy capacity from non-fossilized uh, resources. Uh, this target is pretty much a part of 175 gigawatts of energy that India wishes to uh, get involved in through renewable sources. But since we have already achieved it in 2019 itself, this target has been uh, further enhanced to 450 gigawatts of energy by 2030. And the third area is we are wishing to uh, establish uh, additional carbon sinks to a tune of 2.3 to 3 billion tons uh, carbon dioxide equivalent by the end of 2030 through reforestation and afforestation mechanisms. This is the second area of global governance where India has proactively contributed. The third aspect is that of uh, constituting what came to be known as technology facilitation mechanism. India had encouraged uh, setting up an organization which would proactively looked, look into transfer of cleaner and greener technologies from the developed world to the developing world. Although negotiations are still in progress, uh, India has, uh, by and, uh, time and again, <coughs> emphasized the fact that the developed world has made certain commitments, and it is good time that they should come true on it. India has been highlighting Chapter 34 of Agenda 21, uh, which came out in 1992, and Article 4, Paragraph 5, of uh, the UNFCCC convention. Uh, the fourth aspect of uh, India's uh, contribution to global governance on sustainable development goals is the coalition. It's, it's a coalition called the International Solar Alliance. Uh, the International Solar Alliance, again, uh, came as a result of uh, the outcome of Paris Agreements of 2015. Uh, so far, 116 countries have uh, shown keen interest in this alliance. This alliance caters to uh, harnessing the potential of uh, solar energy in the tropics as well as subtropics region. However, 94 countries have already signed uh, the ISA agreement framework, uh, framework agreement. Now, taking this point further, in 2018, during the first uh, assembly of ISA, uh, India came out with uh, an idea of setting up a grid called as One Sun, One World, One Grid. Please sum up faster. Uh, yes, sir. 
and uh, the objective of uh, one seven one world one grid is to secure dollar one trillion in international investments for solar energy projects by 2030. And the last aspect uh, of uh, India's contribution to global governance is India has been facilitating uh, through financial mechanisms. And for that, India has constituted India-UN uh, Development Partnership Fund to a tune of $150 million. You can already see that uh, there are certain projects uh, which we are already undertaking in different regions of the world. Uh, however, I'll move quickly to the next point, which is what are some of the challenges that we face when it comes to energy security and identity. So one is constrained international cooperation. Though we are uh, contributing only 2.29 uh, tons uh, per capita carbon emissions, uh, as was evident in Glasgow discussions of 20, COP2016, uh, India was cornered by the developed world for not doing enough to uh, arrest its uh, net carbon emissions, which puts it third next only to US and China. Another aspect is there have been certain failed initiatives from the past, which was very evident when talks began, but nothing actually happened on the ground, when TAPI gas pipeline and uh, IPI gas pipeline could not be concluded. Finally, India has not been able to finance its international commitments. Uh, for instance, even solar mama projects, which India has undertaken in terms of capacity building, remains far uh, from uh, what was already stated. And this is the final aspect of my, of my presentation, where I have looked at the demand and looked at the supply side then merged it with the investments. And what we find is we are not quite on the path of attaining sustainability in terms of energy efficiency uh, and energy usage by 2030. With this, I'd like to conclude uh, by saying that although India has certain security and identity challenges at home, nonetheless, its proactive role in global governance and shaping the SDGs has been a major forsake for the South-South cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Urza Tapan. I'm a PhD scholar at Seaport uh, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. My topic of presentation is Beyond UN Multilateralism, Tackling Challenges of Complex Multipolarity in Global Governance Through Minilateralism. My paper ponders over the idea of minilateral fro forums reinvigorating UN-style multilateralism uh, in the post-pandemic world order by assessing the strengths and weaknesses of minilaterals as well as understanding how they can contribute to the idea of reformed multilateralism in an age of complex multipolarity. So uh, as the shifting power balance suggests, there are several fault lines in the current model of multilateralism. We had the COVID-19 outbreak, the urgency uh, to combat climate change, the ongoing conflicts in Europe and uh, West Asia, be it Russia, Ukraine, or the Israel versus Hamas conflict. They've all exposed the deficiencies of current multilateral organizations to maintain international peace and solidarity. Uh, there are mounting tensions between US and China. They have prompted uh, governments in the Indo-Pacific region, West Asia, and other areas to prioritize their national uh, interests while seeking al alternative solutions. Yeah, the status quo powers perceive uh, international reforms as a zero-sum game. For instance, the US and Europe, they never agree for reforms in the Bretton Woods system or in the UN because they believe that this will diminish their control and power to reach a consensus or vote on reform. Also, the realities of the new complex uh, global system, they seem at tension with uh, multilateralism giving rise to complex multipolarity. In simple words, this means that you have multiple poles like the US, China, European Union, uh, Russia, India, and several other regional powers competing for political and economic dominance. So China's increasing dominance has led it to create its own parallel multilateral framework, like the BRICS, New Development Bank, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Uh, you have minilateral, plurilateral groupings like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Belt and Road Initiative, etc. And this shift could occur more quickly than projected, as now uh, rivals like uh, ri US rivals like Russia and Iran, they face cumulative tensions and isolations, and they are also teaming up with China to form their own minilateral and plurilateral groupings. So India's push for functional UN reform is reflected in the following three developments. The UN multilateralism majorly suffered uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic when supply chains were disrupted and nations shut their borders. 
the enduring conflict between Russia and Ukraine. That's why India this time in G20 had a task force dedicated to reform multilateralism. That was the task force number seven. And in addition, China's growing economic and military power as demonstrated by its belligerence in the Indo-Pacific region. And you have the Chinese influence in multilateral organizations as the UN, uh, which is also growing. Uh, China has exerted pressure on the former UN human rights chief to halt a report on Uyghurs uh, in China, as well as uh, it continues to veto uh, its power against India in the United Nations Security Council. The UN is obviously a spot for an absence for leadership at the moment. And thus, you have the rise of alternatives. You have minilateral and plurilateral groupings coming up. Minilaterals are basically informal, and they are more focused initiatives targeting a specific threat or a particular security issue with fewer states, usually three or four. And they have shared interests in resolving it within a limited period of time. Minilaterals uh, have few participants. They are ad hoc approaches. They have flexibility. They have speed. They have modularity and the ability to experiment. These uh, arrangements are voluntary and bottom-up in nature. You have several examples lying around. You have the AUKUS, you have the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, Quad, you have the I2U2, you have the very recent IMEC, India Middle East Europe Corridor, an uh, economic corridor, and this rise of minilateralism suggests that how min middle powers are trying to bypass the growing US-China rivalry in the complex multipolar world and carve out their own uh, niche in the field of global diplomacy. The best example of failing multilateralism is also evident in the failure of the Doha round, where we saw how North and South were unable to reach a uh, consensus, and thus you see several plurilateral trade agreements coming up, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and the more recent one, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. So minilateralism is becoming more and more important than global uh, cooperation. But uh, there are several cons of this kind of uh, minilateral forums. Minilateralism can result in weakening of global governance and minilaterals uh, diminish accountability. They result in forum shopping and voluntary and non-binding pledges by such groupings may not be as effective in dealing with transnational issues like cybersecurity, climate change, migration, macroeconomic stability. So for these, uh, these challenges, you actually need multilateral governance and minilaterals for that matter cannot provide an alternative in this regard. So the basic purpose of uh, you know, middle powers like India, especially in this case, is to look for how these minilateral groupings can be channelized to progress multilateralism rather than weaken it. India itself is not new to minilateralism. It's part of G4, uh, that is Brazil, Germany, Japan, and India, SARC, BIMSTEC, IBSA, BRICS, Indian Ocean Rim Association, Quad, uh, India, France, Australia. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Uh, supply Chain Resilience Initiative, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and several others. So, minilaterals can actually supplement multiple multilateral efforts. You had a very successful example of this in the form of general agreement of tariffs and trade. That was a GATT, which was uh, initially a minilateral or a plurilateral grouping, and later on it was multilateralized, and today we have the WTO. So, you know, even these initiatives of Quad, AUKUS, etc., they can be expanded <laughs> and they can actually lead to more formal connections of multilateralism wherein nations can actually bring their national interests together. So once these coalitions are on course towards attaining their main objective, they can begin to consider strategies to extend their membership. And minilaterals are a means of improving political interaction and boosting confidence. Thus, despite these potential advantages of minilateralism, it is crucial not to exaggerate its benefits or underestimate its risks. If not implemented with caution, minilateralism can undermine global authority and all the efforts for global governance <coughs> till now. Thus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Human trafficking. You have heard about trafficking. There are different chairs. अभी हमारे यहाँ प्रेजेंट किया उसमें जो है ड्रग ट्रैफिकिंग के बारे में बात कर रहे थे तो देर आर मेनी फेसेस वन ऑफ दैट इज ह्यूमन एस्पेक्ट्स व्हिच इज ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग तो ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग के बारे में जब हम बात करते हैं तो ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग इज अ ग्लोबल प्रॉब्लम और इंडिया जो है उससे काफ़ी ज़्यादा प्रभावित होता है 
तो दैट अफेक्ट्स मिलियन ऑफ पीपल विथ इंडिया बींग वन ऑफ द कंट्रीज मोस्ट अफेक्टेड इट इज़ अ कॉम्प्लेक्स क्राइम अब इसके इशूज क्या क्या हैं उसको समझना बहुत जरूरी है तो ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग विथ वर्ल्ड वाइड प्रॉब्लम मिलियंस ऑफ पीपल बींग ट्रैफिक एवरी ईयर द मेजोरिटी ऑफ विक्टिम्स आर वीमेन एंड चिल्ड्रेन हु आर फोर्स इन टू लेबर और सेक्सुअल एक्सप्लाइटेशन ट्रैफिकर्स यूज वेराइटी ऑफ टैक्टिस अब उनका वो टैक्टिक्स क्या है तो दे फिजिकल वायलेंस इज वन ऑफ देम देन आफ्टर इमोशनल एब्यूज इज देयर डेप्ट बॉन्डेज विच इज ऑल्सो वन ऑफ द मोस्ट राइजिंग आस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग मेनी विक्टिम्स आर अफ्रेड टू सीक हेल्प बिकॉज दे आर दे फियर रिट्रीब्यूशन फ्रॉम देम तो आप सब ने एक स्लैंग वर्ड सुना होगा कबूतरबाजी हिंदी में वो ट्रैफिकर्स उनके लिए यूज़ किया जाता है लॉ इन्फोर्समेंट के द्वारा जिसमें इलीगल इमिग्रेशन की आ, की जाती है तो अकॉर्डिंग टू डाटा एनालिसिस इट इज़ द थर्ड लार्जेस्ट क्रिमिनल इंटरप्राइज अगर बिजनेस आस्पेक्ट्स के रूप में देखें तो अकॉर्डिंग टू इंटरनेशनल लेबर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन द एनुअल प्रॉफिट ऑफ ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग इज थर्टी टू बिलियन डॉलर विच इज़ वन ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट बिजनेस इंटरप्राइज फॉर दैम अब ग्लोबल स्कोप क्या है ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग का तो ग्लोबल सर्वे इंडेक्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री के अकॉर्डिंग हाईलाइट दैट सिक्स जी ट्वेंटी नेशन इंक्लूडिंग इंडिया अकाउंट्स फॉर ओवर हाफ ऑफ द वर्ल्ड मॉडर्न स्लेवरी विक्टिम्स इंडिया एलोन हैज इलेवन मिलियन विक्टिम्स ऑफ मॉडर्न स्लेवरी इन कंपासिंग मैन वीमेन एंड चिल्ड्रेन ग्लोबल रैंकिंग ऑफ मॉडर्न स्लेवरी प्रिवेलेंस द रिपोर्ट लिस्ट ट्रेन कंट्रीज विद द हाइस्ट प्रिवेलेंस ऑफ मॉडर्न स्लेवरी विच इंक्लूड्स नॉर्थ कोरिया एरिट्रिया सऊदी अरेबिया टर्की तजिकिस्तान यू ए रसिया अफगानिस्तान एंड कुवैत I will not go much in details because time is not there much. So, impacts of COVID-19 on ch child production, which was one of the highlight of this issue, the pandemic increased vulnerability among children and women, leading to a 16.2 percent rise in crimes against children in 2021 uh, compared to the previous year, which is the NCRB data. Uh, there is a gender-specific crimes, which is one third of crimes against children are registered under the POCSO Act. act and sexual crimes against children shows a strong gender tilt with adolescent girls 12 to 16 years of age bracket uh, being victims in over 99% of cases under the poxo act so we took delhi as our base analysis and we found that pending cases in delhi increased by over 4% in 2021 which was 94419 cases under police investigation and uh, the holistic approach to find out this is three p's system which is prevention protection and prosecution and uh, the investigative techniques which are being used are undercover operations uh, in which we involve placing an investigator in a situation where they can observe and collect information surveillance system which is also used to monitor suspects and uh, gather evidence and forensic analysis जिसमें कि डीएनए एनालिसिस फिंगरप्रिंटिंग और डिजिटल फॉरेंसिक्स का यूज करते हैं कोलैबोरेशन और पार्टनरशिप्स में देर आर गवर्नमेंट एजेंसीज नॉन गवर्नमेंट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड जी में अलग अलग आपने सुना प्राइवेट सेक्टर कंपनीज को इन्वॉल्व कर सकते हैं इसमें देन आफ्टर रोल ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी क्या है इसमें तो रोल ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी जो है वो थ्री एस्पेक्ट्स में आता है विच इज़ डाटा एनालिसिस जिसमें कि हम ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग के कॉमन जो ट्रैफिक रूट्स हैं उनको हाईलाइट कर सकते हैं एंड लोकेशंस को पिन पॉइंट करके उनके ऊपर एक टैब रखा जा सकता है सोशल मीडिया मॉनिटरिंग जिसमें कि डार्क डार्क नेट के बारे में बात कर बात करते हैं उस पर भी काफ़ी कुछ ज़्यादा किया जा सकता है एंड एंड माई कंक्लूजन इज ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग इज अ कॉम्प्लेक्स इशूज विच रिक्वायर्स हॉलिस्टिक इन्वेस्टिगेशन अप्रोच कंबाइंस विद ट्रेडिशनल लॉ इन्फोर्समेंट टेक्निक्स विद कम्युनिटी इंगेजमेंट विक्टिम सेंटर्ड सर्विसेज शुड बी ओपन एंड टेक्नोलॉजी ऑफर अ प्रोमिसिंग सोल्यूशन ऑन दिस प्रॉब्लम so we must continue to prioritize this issue and work towards a world where a human trafficking no longer exists thank you thank you sir kumar you have touched the burning topic of uh, this area uh, human trafficking in different areas like bonded labor child labor and sex trafficking may be resolved only with collaborative efforts at global level price efforts next speaker sonak kumar sonak gupta 
a very good afternoon everyone my name is sanak gupta and i am a student of masters in international relations at gunanak dev university <clears throat> uh, today i'll be presenting the findings of my research on the topic global health governance india's contribution and challenges it faced in ensuring the health security worldwide today we will understand and explore how the health scenario changed worldwide post covid 19 pandemic and how the world shifted from the low politics which was more or less based on the humanitarian concerns to the high politics making the recognition that the health issues have direct and indirect implications for national and international security now before we move forward let us understand what is global health governance global health governance refers to the system of rules agreements and institutions that manage and coordinate the international efforts to address the global health challenges now the question arises what is the need to address the importance the first one is economic <coughs> impact the health crisis have can have devastating economic economic consequences pandemics disrupt trade uh, travel and also supply chain <coughs> leading to the economic recessions and loss of jobs the next is global interconnectedness in our increasingly interconnected world diseases can spread rapidly across the borders a health threat in one country can quickly become a global pandemic if not contained the covid-19 pandemic is one such example the next one is global health inequality health security is not just about the preventing pandemics it's also about ensuring that everyone regardless of their location has access to the essential healthcare services addressing the global health security helps reduce disparities in healthcare and promote health equally next one is humanitarian concern ensuring global health security is fundamentally about protecting human lives timely responses to the health threats such as outbreaks of infectious diseases can mean the difference between the life and death for individual and communities now India plays a significant role in global health in various capacities due to its large population, growing healthcare industry, research capabilities, and international collaborations. Here are some key as aspects of the India's role in world health. The first one is pharmaceutical industry. India is known as the pharmacy of the world. As a former Vice President M. Venkatesh Naidu have also said. I have also called upon the pharmaceutical industry of India to make India an international capital of generic medicines. Currently, the India's pharmaceutical industry is valued at around fifty billion dollars, and it is expected to reach around sixty-five billion dollars by twenty twenty-four and around one thirty billion dollars by twenty thirty. The next one is vaccine production. <clears throat> India contributes to around ninety percent of the worldwide need for measles vaccine. It also provides to forty-two of. Uh, Uh, 65 to 70 percent of the vaccine requirements of the World Health Organization, and <clears throat> during the COVID-19 pandemic also, India provided around 242 million doses of the affordable vaccine to around 101 different nations. The next one is research and innovation. Indian researchers and scientists <clears throat> make valuable contribution to global health through their work in areas such as pharmaceuticals, biotechnology. epidemiology and health technology the indian government places a significant focus on advancing research and development with the goal of developing innovative technologies the next comes the disease eradication program india has successfully eliminated or made significant pro progress in controlling various diseases like polio leprosy etc currently india is undergoing three national programs the first one is national vector borne diseases control program national leprosy eradication program and national tuberculosis elimination program the last comes the health diplomacy india engages in the health diplomacy to strengthen its international partnerships share knowledge and provide humanitarian assistance yes ma'am <clears throat> humanitarian assistance during the health emergencies reflecting its commitment to world health security lastly i will provide some recommendations for the india to uh, to increase its strength and its contribution in pursuit of global health governance the first one is we must prioritize the substantial investment in the healthcare infrastructure the second one is encourage the partnerships between the public and private healthcare sectors to improve the healthcare accessibility and quality the third one is collaborate with the international partners on research and development projects to drive innovations in healthcare and the last one is to invest in the preventive healthcare measures to reduce the burden of diseases thank you so much thank you so much we have talked about global health governance role of india definitely in this journey is 
invited to resolve the challenges of health disparities. Next speaker is Amna Juhara, student side Joseph University Bangalore. The role of e-governance in bridging the digital divide. Amna Juhara. Good evening to one and all. Um, I'm Amna Zara from St. Joseph's University, Bangalore. And I'll be presenting about the role of e-governance and the digital divide. The digital divide, an economic and social inequality in access to modern information and communication technology has been a pressing concern. Nowhere is this gap more evident than in the diverse landscapes of India where disparities in digital access persist across urban and rural areas. So uh, now I'll be giving you a brief about the uh, role and the e-governance, digital divide of e-governance. So now my research basically focuses on uh, how this came to be in the digital space of education and how it is very unfortunate for the lesser privileged to get access to it and uh, what we can do to tackle it and what the government of India has uh, released PMGD, uh, DISHA, which is a project uh, to tackle the problems of the lesser privileged and their educational concerns. This is the introduction. So the main problems that we could see with digital education in an overall view were the infrastructural hurdles, you know, technological difficulties, and like, you know, problems uh, with the, you know, repetitive absence in online classes and in online classes and as well as the resource constraints. So the main problem that I've seen in my research for the absence in, like, you know, repetitive access, absence in online classes, uh, it was, you know, differentiating for, a, where, for where it classes in India as well as the world. The lesser privileged, you know, they were usually the breadwinners and they did not have time or their issues were considered more serious. And this is not to say that in any other divide or class that it isn't less serious, but it was usually carelessness or probably, you know, the technological difficulties. And even the access to high running internet, 4G or 5G, was more lesser for this class. This is something that I noticed. And I think personally to tackle this, I think NGOs and local trainers, they're a very good way uh, to look after the issue. And there have been many initiatives in India. I do know someone in Bangalore who has this initiative and that they've gone through educating about it as well as providing resources. But these smaller groups of NGOs really do not help the larger outcome. This was one problem that the India, government of India personally faced. And we would need more initiatives or maybe you know reduce the prices or something. But obviously in the economy that we have now, this was seen as a very difficult task. Uh, awareness about it, uh, spreading it towards the elders or whatever, and motivation for the kids to be more attentive or like just because it was an online class, you know, not necessary that they have a loss of access or something. And I think just like I personally said, NGOs are a very good way of helping if more people participated in providing initiatives. I think limited... Okay, I'm so sorry. Not at all. You don't have to be sorry. You're not inviting us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I'll focus immediately on PMGDISHA. This was released in uh, October 9, 2017. And they had a strategic planning just like releasing local institutions and comprehensive coverage. They even made a customized curriculum for the issue in addressing the specific issues and problems of the rural learners. Um, and then, like I said, the local networks as well. Now I'll conclude the issue. 
I met the global pandemic, uh, they played a pivotal role because, uh, you know, for digital education facilitation, they ensured the individuals had essential digital skills and adapting to online learning during school closures. Access to information and government services, they made sure that the kids do have immediate access and in case they had any difficulty, they had immediate teachers and attendees to attend the, their issues and care for them. And they made sure for the most of it, the students would have a great experience learning online, but obviously there would be other tactics as well. And you can't really control everything as a whole. And remote work opportunities as well. These kids or like older kids were provided uh, work opportunities so they can balance both of them and as well as you know, create a fund for themselves so that they can help themselves in the future. And personally, I think, like I said, us as a population, we have to put in more effort and, uh, in, you know, personal, our personal concerns on this issue so that it leaps better on the future. And uh, we can make sure that the lesser privileged, even now they have, they face problems in education more than us. And I feel like personally, if we put an initiative and we encourage others to put an initiative, we can make a change forward. And this was my point of this whole research and presentation. And I hope this message was, com com you know, uh, this message was forwarded to people. Yeah, this is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amnadi. In this information era, this is studies more viable. Amnadi has uh, good intervention in this arena. The challenges in this area of digital transformation and digital economy we may, uh, may redefine at this junction of sustained growth. So now we invite next uh, Dr. Seema Chaudhary, Professor of Sanskrit Government College, Bundi, Jain Dhamma Me Satat Paryavaran Sanukshan. Dr. Seema Chaudhary. Not present. Next speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Dikshit, Assistant Professor of History, Maharaja Agrasen, Himalaya, Garhwal University, and Rupali Vashish, Research Scholar, Maharaja Agrasen, Himalaya, Garhwal University. Uttarakhand, Kalasat ki Suraksha, Pehchan, or Vashik Netra. Not present? Jyoti, research scholar, Maharaja Agrasen, Himalaya, Garwal University, Prakhan, Rajasthan versus Haryana ke Kisano ke Swatantutra Sangram mein sayo. Is she present? Jyoti? Not present. Good evening, everybody. Respect to my chair and paper presenters present here. So I will be presenting topic, Understanding Livelihood Uncertainties and mechanisms for coping with environmental stress and shock across different ecological zones of West Bengal. My name is Dhundini Kaur, I'm a research scholar from the University of Calcutta, Department of Anthropology. Climate change is now an important global phenomenon affecting people across the globe in both developed and developing economies. IPCC has also stated that in its assessment report that global temperature will increase a couple of degrees which will raise the sea level and there remain the chances of the submergence of the low-lying coastal areas. And there will be an increase in the frequency of the extreme climatic events like cyclones, floods, and drought. It leads to uncertainties in people, climate change leads to uncertainties in people's lives in those areas that cause disruption in the functioning of the society, which creates massive loss, particularly among uh, natural resource-dependent communities. People living in disaster-prone areas are always vulnerable to such consequences. Environmental stress puts pressure on vulnerable population, suffering from poverty, food scarcity, land degradation, livelihood instability, and lack of adequate housing. We need to understand why people still live amid uncertainties and how they understand uncertainty. What are the livelihood options available to the people in environmental stress and shock? What strategies they adopt to recover from such stresses and shocks, how vulnerable communities dependent on natural resources can enhance their resilience to environmental stress and shock. <sighs> These are the objectives of my research. 
We need to understand uncertainty from local people perspective in changing environmental conditions, including environmental <coughs> stresses and shock in contrasting ecological zones. Uh, to explore and analyze diversification of livelihood strategies of the people of different social categories affected by environmental stress and shock in contrasting ecological zones. To identify and analyze the coping strategies, um, pattern and their impediments and felt problems of the local people, patterns of resilience across time and to relate them to their livelihood strategies across varying social categories. To examine the responses and roles of the state and other political agencies in resilience building under the uncertain condition caused by environmental change, stresses and shocks. These are the research questions. Actually, people uh, try, to, try to cope with the con continuous changing situation. They always try to get resilient using their uh, local knowledge system, which they used to gather or accumulate um, from the different generations. And they uh, used to fight with the changing situation with their knowledge system. Um, so local knowledge system is very uh, local knowledge system and uh, these are very important and if we can uh, trace this uh, knowledge system uh, so we can we can understand how the local people are uh, coping with the changing situation how what coping strategies are they adopting to cope with the changing situation so uh, local knowledge system if can be combined with the global knowledge global knowledge that it is it will be very helpful to form coping strategies that will uh, help us to create sustainable climate policies so this is the methodology the study will be carried out in a diverse set of livelihood system that are experiencing the environmental stresses and shocks in some ecological zones of west bengal Selection of the area and the people to study is done with the help of archival data, some academic publications and some government reports. Qualitative methods will be uh, used in the research. Structured interviews will be used to collect the household data. Uh, observation method, semi-structured interviews, in-depth interviews, focus group, group case studies and visual methods. This will be the methods used in the study. Study area. Norm, uh, one flat prone area that is Chundarban and one broad prone area that is Purulia is selected. Description of the study area mainly I have selected Moshuni. This is a Gram Panchayat under South Chopish Parguna block Namkhana. Uh, this block is affected by sea level rise, river bank erosion, and frequent breaching of embankment. Salt water inundation can cause soil salinity, which make the cultivation difficult for the farmers. Uh, the four mojas. Uh, of among the four mojas of the uh, Moshuni Island, uh, two are ocean fronted mojas and severely erosion prone. People of Moshuni are mostly uh, natural resource dependent communities. They are either farmers, fishermen, or owners of fish, uh, fishery, and some are forest resource collected. They are mostly dependent on nat natural resources to maintain their livelihood. So some of the challenges or problems faced by the local people, that is sea level rise, breaching, yeah, uh, flag, breaching. Flag your important points. We yeah, appreciate yeah. all the things are very comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, some problems or challenges, that is sea level rise, breaching of embankment, uh, soil erosion, uh, soil salinity due to salt water inundation, late onset of monsoon, frequent cyclonic storm with tidal surges, Inconsistent or unpredictable, uh, unpredicted rainfall pattern, loss of livelihood, increased attacks on pay of pests, and what coping strategies or mitigation strategies they have adopted. That is a, mostly that modification of agricultural practices like making changes in the time of the preparation of seedbed, cultivation of, of some salt resistant crops after salt water inundation of the agricultural land, cultivation of some leguminous plants to increase soil fertility as the quality of soil is also falling down. Uh, digging ponds to increase fresh, fresh water store, diversification of livelihood store, uh, sources from agriculture to fishing, fishing and fishing to some other livelihood option, shifting to alternative livelihood, uh, shifting to alter alternative livelihood option which are less dependent on natural resources, restoration of mangrove which will act as coastal buffers and adopting short term migration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
continue to study about livelihood uncertainties prevailing in different zones of West Bengal in special reference to environmental seismic status uh, exist in this area. Good analytical study in this concern. Thanks, Nandini. Last speaker is Prabhu Sanj, Nuclear Diplomacy and Global Governance. Student Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar. You see, we live in such a world. Jisko kaha to jata hai, it's a global village. But uske divergences itne jada ho gaye hain. Aur agar is tarikhe ke session ko, when you have to give the concluding remarks, the challenges are many. But as I was born in a city where Mahendra Singh Dhoni is from, Rachi. My workplace is Banaras, so I think Dr. Madam ne jo mujhe ye kaam diya hai, it is in the safe hands. I don't know about mine. The task of historian is to sense sense of past and to tell the story of transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, the organizers objectives have been met more than they achieved. My English may be, but I am saying that I am congratulating them. Because the topic is so vital, the topic is so thematic and relevant and pertinent. <coughs> Security, identity and governance. And governance that too of globe. A globe where a security analyst he said that we are living in a time where America, which is democracy, is behaving in a dictatorial way. And China, which is only surviving communist, talks about foreign policy democratization. So it is very, very difficult. But I am very happy. I am jubilant. I am optimist, despite a lot of younger generation people presenting paper, now they are no longer visible. The topic is extremely wide ranging. If Dr. Bobby presented on skill development, in our time it was question of literacy and illiteracy. When Murarji Desai became Prime Minister, he launched Prod Siksha, and now we have skill. So it was really, I mean, he, the recommendations which he recommended to the affair panelist paper was fascinating. Sundarbans, statistical details, and all that. Really, it added to our knowledge. Trivedivish things on India and Gulf cooperation. Very, very uh, significant. And the points which he raised. In our time, you know, India's foreign policy was the other security. India is a pop fixated country, but now look at the fascinating advance that we have made in our diplomacy. Narsimha Rao's look east policy. You know, India is being rediscovered, reimagined. Morning, Director General Sir, he so much elaborated on the point about India's, you know, India's, uh, you can say, re rise. We are, we are being really decolonized in our mind. We can regional languages. Our government is national education policy. Despite all the plurality and diversity. Which is very, so even this session was marked by that diversity. Uh, Chinmay, he presented a very, very important paper on the entire aspect of, you know, Solar alliance, energy, which is so vital. You know, you have done a, a human service. I must add, you have done a human service educating on this vital matter. Because any finance minister, energy And at this point of time, it is so volatile, isn't it? So you have given us many fodder for thought, as uh, I would say. Urja, I don't see her, but. Uh, 
see uh, by conceptualizing at our point of time it was bilateral from 1991 built Clinton unilateral and now we have minilateral <laughs> multilateral as well as minilateral I mean the world has uh, yeah so it has changed so much uh, our junior partner Shabnam and Sumit Banaras uh, this human trafficking is an uh, important component of human security. In security, what is the human security? Uh, so, these are the things. Uh, Gupta's presentation on the entire spectrum of health. Health is wealth, it has been reinforced. It has been reinforced. And the entire gamut which he took us it was really wonderful. Koi Bangalore se aaye or digital divide ke baare mein baat kar. Very interesting. The lady is not here. Amnal Zuhara. She talked about divide. Jab hum log independence ke baad baat karte the to baat karte the north south divide. Yeah, the lady he presented. She presented a paper on digital divide, which is very important. Students, corona ke baad bahut khush hote the. The teachers ka dialogue by face. <laughs> so this thing has really changed. Uh, Nandini's presentation was really because uh, you know you come from a department. My father was an anthropologist, so this, uh, this subject to very really itna important, and uh, the entire gamut of uh, things which you took us. Unfortunately, due to paucity of time, I could not gain much. I mean the entire uh, one step research objective, second step methodology, area of research and all. So it's, I, I always think that historian and anthropologist yahi dono sabse jaga wise or wisdom wale ho sakte hai, because they study in totality. Okay, so from all of us, congratulations. It has been a wonderful experience listening to the young minds and these are the young minds who will continue to gain us. Thank you, madam, so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Vasishman. Thanks Pratt. to all. Thanks to organizers who uh, organized this uh, such an event. And to uh, and viewers, thanks to all. Thanks, especially thanks to Nandini. Yes, Nandini, Vasishman, madam, let's go. Right, right, right. Ma'am, just double tap uh, to capture the mic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I acknowledge to to organize this such a good event and uh, to uh, include all of us. So uh, I think that uh, our young researchers will learn many things from this uh, event.